It's the counterintuitive stuff in epidemiology that always really interests me. One intuition many of us have is that if a risk factor is significantly associated with an outcome, knowledge of that risk factor would help to predict that outcome. Makes sense? Feels right? But it's not right. Not always. A fake example to illustrate my point. Let's say we have 10,000 individuals who we follow for 10 years and 2,000 of them die. It's been a rough decade. At baseline, I had measured a novel biomarker, the Perry factor, in everyone. To keep it simple, the Perry factor has only two values, zero or one. I then do a standard associational analysis and find this. Individuals who are positive for the Perry factor have a 40-fold higher odds of death than those who are negative for it. I'm beginning to reconsider ascribing my good name to this biomarker. This is a highly statistically significant result, a p-value less than 0.001. So, clearly, knowledge of the Perry factor should help me predict who will die in the cohort. Now, I evaluate predictive power using a metric called the Area Under the Receiver Operator Curve, AUC, referred to as the C statistic in time to event studies. It tells you, given two people, one who dies and one who doesn't, how frequently you pick the right person given the knowledge of their Perry factor. So a C statistic of 0.5 or 50% would mean the Perry factor gives you no better results than a coin flip, chance. A C statistic of one is perfect prediction. So what will the C statistic be? given the incredibly strong association of the Perry factor with outcomes. 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.5024, almost useless. Let's figure out why strength of association and usefulness for prediction are not always the same thing. Now, I constructed my fake Perry Factor data set quite carefully to illustrate this point. Let me show you what happened. What you see here is a breakdown of the patients in my fake study. You can see that just 11 of them were Perry Factor positive, but 10 of those 11 ended up dying. That's quite unlikely by chance alone. It really does appear that if you have Perry Factor, your risk of death is much higher. But the reason that Perry Factor is a bad predictor is because it's so rare in the population. Sure, you can use it to correctly predict the outcome of 10 of the 11 people who have it, but the vast majority of people don't have Perry Factor. It's useless to distinguish who will die versus who will live in that population. Okay, why have I spent so much time trying to reverse our intuition that strength of association and strength of predictive power must be related? Because it helps to explain this paper appearing this week in JAMA, which is a, a very nice piece of work trying to help us better predict cardiovascular disease. Now, I don't need to tell you that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in this country and most of the world. I don't need to tell you that we have really good preventative therapies and lifestyle interventions that can reduce the risk. But it would be nice to know in whom, specifically, we should use those interventions. Cardiovascular risk scores to date are Pretty simple. The most common one in use in the U.S., the pooled cohort risk equation, has nine variables, two of which require a cholesterol panel and one a blood pressure test. It's easy. And it's pretty accurate. Using the score from the pooled cohort risk calculator, you get a C statistic as high as 0.82 when applied to black women, a low of 0.71 when applied to black men, and non-black individuals are in the middle. It's not bad, but clearly not perfect. And aren't we in the era of big data, the era of personalized medicine? We have dozens, maybe hundreds of quantifiable biomarkers that are associated with subsequent heart disease. Surely, by adding these biomarkers into the risk equation, we can improve prediction, right? The study in question includes 164,054 patients pooled from 28 cohort studies from 12 countries. All the studies measured various key biomarkers at baseline and followed their participants for cardiovascular events like heart attack, stroke, coronary revascularization, and so on. The biomarkers in question are really the big guns in this space. Troponin, a marker of stress on the heart muscle, NT-proBNP, a marker of stretch on the heart muscle, and C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation. In every case, 
higher levels of these markers at baseline were associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease in the future. Troponin T shown here has a basically linear risk with subsequent cardiovascular disease. BNP seems to demonstrate more of a threshold effect where levels above 60 start to associate with problems. NCRP does a similar thing with levels above one. All of these findings were statistically significant. If you have higher levels of one or more of these biomarkers, you are more likely to have cardiovascular disease in the future. Of course, our old friend, the pooled cohort risk equation is still here in the background, requiring just that one blood test and measurement of blood pressure. So let's talk about predictive power. The pooled cohort risk equation score in this study had a C statistic of 0.812. By adding troponin, BNP, and CRP to the equation, the new C statistic is 0.819. Barely any change. Now, the authors looked at various different types of prediction here. The greatest improvement in the AUC was seen when they tried to predict heart failure within one year of measurement. There, the AUC improved by 0.04. But the presence of BNP as a biomarker and the short time window of one year makes me wonder if this is really prediction at all or whether they were essentially just diagnosing people with existing heart failure. So why does this happen? Why do these promising biomarkers clearly associated with bad outcomes fail to improve our ability to predict the future? I already gave one example, which was has to do with how the markers are distributed in the, in the population. But more relevant here even is that the new markers can only improve prediction insofar as they are not already represented in the old predictive model. Of course, BNP, for example, wasn't in the old model, but smoking was, diabetes was, blood pressure was. All of that data might actually tell you something about the patient's BNP through their mutual correlation. An improvement in prediction requires new information. This is actually why I consider this a really successful study. We need to do studies like this to help us find what those new sources of information might be. It doesn't seem like these biomarkers will help us in our effort to risk stratify people. So we move on to other domains. Perhaps social determinants of health would improve risk prediction. Perhaps insurance status. Perhaps environmental exposures. Perhaps markers of stress. We'll never get to a C statistic of one. Perfect. Prediction is the domain of palm readers and astrophysicists, but better prediction is always possible through data. The big question, of course, is which data? From Medscape, I'm Perry Wilson.